I'm sorry that you all are seeing so much of me up in the front of the room today, um, but uh, and I'll try to keep my presence to a minimum. Um, and I did want to, however, you know, I actually normally carry around with me, as I did this morning, my purse, which is very heavy because it has my iPhone, my iPad, and my laptop in it. I thought, I, you know, I have all panels. This is the one I probably should have brought them to and put them all out on the counter, you know, just to prove that I don't just know, I don't go to the whole Cold War, but also, you know, have some interest in new media as well. Um, uh, this is an absolutely extraordinary group of people that we have managed to, and that's not a self-congratulation, I just consider we were really, really lucky um, to be able to get these people here today. And um, you heard from um, people who were talking larger about their experiences, you know, looking at now from experiences covering Russia during the Cold War and its ending, and now we have um, a very interesting mixture of people. On, on the one hand, we have some of the people who are really making um, the cutting edge um, media statements today involved in the protests, um, creating, you know, doing what was being talked about at the last panel. And we also have um, one of the most respected times uh, journalist who has both served as a correspondent in Russia in the post-Cold War period and studied um, media and how it works in Russia today. And some of you may have seen Alessandra Stanley's um, article on Russian television in the Times in February. So I'm not going to take time and introduce people partially because it's all in the program and partially because I'm hoping that especially the Russian participants will be talking a little bit at least about their own activity. Um, because all of them are actively involved um, in what's going on. Um, so on that note, um, for lack of a better format, or unless anybody wants to dispute it, I believe that we are going to go in the order of the program. And uh, so I will welcome very heartily here someone we've really wanted to have at Columbia for a long time. Um, Grigory Shvedov, and as I said, I'm not going to introduce him. I think okay. many of you of you in the audience know of his activity. He's already been mentioned here, and I hope, as I, we talked about, you'll say a little bit about it. Thank you very much. Um, I have 15 minutes, so uh, I would try to just address the, um, the challenges, the questions I've got uh, from the organizers uh, of the conference, and thanks for inviting. Uh, but first of all, I want to be very formal. Our conference is great because it has a very concrete title, uh, and it's a question, as you see. Uh, and it's asking if a Cold War is really finished. Uh, and I don't think so. Uh, and that a provocative uh, point for our discussion uh, I want actually to share uh, during my 15-minute uh, thing. Uh, why I don't think so? Because let's see what's happening in our country, at least in Russia. Definitely it might be different in the United States. I'm talking uh, about my personal opinion on what's going on in Russia. Uh, we have a, a very aggressive coverage on different meetings. American ambassadors have a Russian opposition. We have a very aggressive uh, uh, TV programs which are showing how uh, bad the United States is influencing our country, and not only the United States, but the way other countries as well. And we are not having it with a new ambassador only. We've been having it for a long time already. It became a very aggressive during uh, the times of new ambassador, Mr. McFall, but it is, uh, uh, it is actually not something very unique. Uh, unfortunately, I need to say that anti-Americanism is something which is very widespread. And um, answering uh, no to the question if a Cold War really finished, I would um, probably make an accent. Um, yes, it is different. Um, yes, we do have in a society more aggression than an uh, uh, action of a state. Um, so answering in this provocative way to this question, I'm uh, talking very much about state of media. I'm talking very much about um, the state of um, political actors, uh, and not particularly about the government, what government says. For me, truly speaking, not so important what government says. What's a Mr. Putin new speech in Davos or in uh, uh, any other place? In the regions of Russia, talking to people, unfortunately, I do see it. I do see that the consciousness of Cold War is still predominant. We still have a major enemies, and the United States is among the top list of major enemies. So that's why, for myself, personally, I had a feeling that we are still living within this frame. 
it is different for sure, but it's not like it is a page which is, you know, turned and we are on other page. Um, how it continues to influence the media? That's one of the uh, brilliant questions I've got from the organizers in advance. Uh, I do think that um, the Soviet media, which was remarkably described by uh, both journalist and uh, writer um, Davlatov, uh, was very often in a time of last 30 years uh, focusing on self-censorship. It was certainly censorship. We are not having censorship today in Russia. That's clearly, I think, was uh, described by uh, Cliff uh, uh, on the previous session. It's not like we're having censorship in Russia. It's not like someone is checking articles before they have been uh, printed. It's not like uh, there are uh, TV uh, watched mostly before they are uh, on air. Um, uh, even TV programs, yes, they are watched. Yes, they are edited, but mostly after they've been shown already in the Far East because even during Medvedev terms, uh, we are living in a big time zone country and uh, some more independent stories uh, are delivered first to the Far East and they're cut after that. So it's not like we're facing censorship, but self-censorship, oh yes. And that's, I believe, the major threat. And that what is a major answer to the question of what continues to influence media. Because the journalists, how do they work? The editors, well, let me put blame on myself how much we are self-censoring our stories, how much we are self-censoring uh, our editorial um, policies. Let me tell you very openly. Uh, we received two types of uh, kind of concerns slash threats from officials. Um, and one type is um, leading to the, uh, to the editing of our content because by Russian law, we have to edit our published stories if uh, the agency called Roskomnadzor send us, a, send us a letter and it is saying, uh, the letter is saying that in our comments there is something inappropriate. Now I'm talking about comments to the articles, not articles themselves. We're talking about new time, uh, new type of journalism. And we have to do it. Unfortunately, that's the Russian law. Unfortunately, um, we are doing it. Um, but we always put a note that it was edited due to the letter from Roskomnadzor which thinks there is extremism, blah, 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 here in this comment. So we let our audience to see that we've been pushed to do it. But at first, the major type of uh, requests we got are completely uh, illegal. They come from all type of agencies. We as a Caucasian Nord 24-7 agency cover the situation in 20 regions of Russia, both Northern Caucasus, South Caucasus, and South of Russia, and we got a permanently request like that. You need to erase that. You need to provide us with IP address from your um, audience. You need to change this. You need to give us information about that. We give it to the lawyer. The lawyer says it's illegal. We forget about it. Well, sometimes we reply to them. But um, uh, it's important that um, the second section, when we're obliged by law to do this kind of thing, uh, is um, only increasing. There's an increasing approach to uh, uh, react to what is published in a very repressive way. Um, it is not as bad as it was during Soviet times as it was described in the previous section. It's not the same. It's not censorship at all. That's after it is published. That's how it's very different. But what we can do with self censorship, what we can do with the journalists who are just afraid to call someone, who are just afraid to go somewhere, who are just afraid, and many of them, as we just uh, discussed uh, during uh, lunch, uh, uh, are actually uh, don't even able to tell they're afraid. Uh, many of them uh, think it's actually appropriate not to cover uh, a different opinion on uh, many stories, just to provide one point of view. And uh, that's a complication of our work. Uh, it's, uh, it's mainly the task for the editors to find out how it's possible to uh, check the different point of view. But um, I think that's, um, uh, uh, that's a good uh, the point to understand that the editors in uh, today's Russia are the people who are targeted by uh, uh, a various way of bureaucrats not to cover different stories, just to have silence. It's not about censoring your materials. It just Please don't go there. Please don't cover this. Why do you need to do it? Very often, personally, I am approached in a very gentle way. 
you know, uh, in, in a very intelligent way. No, it's very often then uh, I got calls and no one is saying like, uh, don't do it or. It's just uh, a very uh, gentle, why do you, it's not correct at all and so on. And so it's a long debate and um, finally we do it. Uh, but um, it's an important understanding um, uh, for the understanding of uh, the country we live in uh, right now that uh, the whole idea of uh, publishing story um, is um, very different from for, for people who work uh, today in a bureaucracy than it was um, earlier. Because for them, it means for the regional level officials, we work on the regional level. Here are the great journalists working on the national level. We're working on the regional level in the Caucasus. For them, it means the information would be distributed more and more on the different levels. If we publish a story, they are scared because their bosses from a national level bureaucracy would read that this kind of thing is happening. So they are not taking care about freedom of speech. We are not taking care about uh, um, uh, victims of uh, human rights violations happening. We are taking care of their chair because the chair might be removed due to the uh, at, uh, due to the procedures where elections are not anymore. Uh, uh, the case, uh, the, uh, the chair might be removed like that, and we have cases already. Then the chair is uh, removed removed under the uh, bureaucrat uh, just due to the, some stories which are. Um, described by the media. Um, coming to the issue of the um, different, um, different challenges um, both our countries um, are facing today, um, that was another uh, issue addressed um, um, for, for my notes. Um, I think it's a lot of debate of uh, new media, of uh, um, citizen journalism, or people's journalists, um, as Nadezhda put it, uh, um, for our work as a regional agency, this is the key important issue. I personally believe that all of this would make a difference if people in the regions we are writing about would take a little bit of responsibility about things which are happening around them and not expect our journalists always visit their village, their small town, or even visit any place uh, in a city in the capital of this region the personal responsibility. Then you see things are happening, and then the things are abuses. Put your cell phone, make a short video, write a text message. We receive text messages and make uh, articles based on the text messages. We do our work with this uh, video and photo materials for the people who took responsibility. I think that would make a difference, not the not the, the most brilliant uh, bloggers, not the most uh, active uh, uh, video uh, makers, or, or how you would call them, but amount of people who would be involved. The, uh, the quality is essential. We do know it. In this particular building, we know it very well. But amount of people, the quantity of people who are involved, that what makes people really worry. And not only officials, who are kind of supporting uh, those who violate the law, but others, the criminals. Because when we do have a video which is watched hundreds of thousands of times, they, strangely enough, monitor this. They say, oh, God, this is watched uh, uh, 600,000 times on YouTube, and this is an unknown guy telling his stories. They react to that. We do have enormous amounts of stories and the people who have been kidnapped uh, thrown from a car in a field because it was in the media, because it was a lot of reaction. And that's my point, what makes a big difference from the previous time, from the time of Cold War and what is a new trend for our work. Because the reaction of people, it's not only their self-responsibility for the things which are happening in their region, in their city, but it's also something which is clearly shown for the audience and audience are also people who are criminals, who are perpetrators, are also people who support the criminals. And they see, God, 500 comments, God, 300,000 views, God, how many likes? They do know it very well. Not all of them, certainly. Not every guy who is torturing someone to death knows these kind of things. But people who pay him, people he worked for, they know. 
And that makes a difference. And there are particular people who um, have been, um, have been um, free from the detention that, um, um, that have been tortured and that stopped. Um, and that's very different from the, uh, from the past, uh, from the um, challenges we had earlier. Because earlier, publishing story, that's the end of the story. That's the end because there is no debate. Because in a country, in the Soviet Union, certainly the debate might be going on somewhere in the kitchen and in another kitchen and another kitchen. Now these kitchens where debate was going on in the Soviet times are very much linked to another. Now, even though there is a ghettoization of those people who really, uh, really are very much focused on the same values, still there is this link between different people and different uh, societies and different groups. And they all influence. They certainly don't influence Russian politics. But I'm talking about the cases about people, the human beings, which are facing trouble right now. And this is a particular um, a very motiv motivating thing uh, for the work of a journalist. And they can see the results of their reaction to their articles. Then you can see that in the comments, I like to say it, it in the comments to our articles, very often we get more interesting, better content than in our articles. Because those people don't self-censor themselves um, very often. But what about the challenges um, uh, you face today? Because the question was about both countries, um, here in the United States. Um, unfortunately, I also want to support what was um, just shared in the previous panel. I think there is also a predominant picture of Russia, uh, how things are going on. Uh, and that uh, is another reason why I'm saying I don't think a Cold War really finished. Because the picture of Russia is very much consists of this uh, um, partly stereotype of a censorship, of a bloody regime, which you know, gives no, no room, uh, no space for people to protest. Yes, we do have a lot of characters of a previous regime currently implemented in the today's practices of officials, but it is way different. And to understand the differences, it's important to, to know the nuances. But who is uh, ordering these nuances? Is, uh, is there is any demand? Any interest, for example, here in the United States, not among researchers, but among the, the audience of the newspapers, to know all of those details, I don't see this. I think the demand is a, is a key uh, answer to this question. Yes, during the USSR United States competition, it was much more a demand from the average people here in the United States than it is now. And now it is, I think, less and less place in uh, lots of newspapers, even uh, great newspapers, and uh, uh, less and less space in, in um, um, reports of uh, even great radio stations and great um, TV companies. And finally, since um, it was 15 minutes, uh, I, I was asked also to give um, some stories on what, um, what's going on um, um, during elections, what was going on. Um, during elections uh, um, this year. The presidential, presidential elections I was uh, uh, celebrating in the Northern Caucasus. And I want to tell you that even though uh, a lot of people in the Northern Caucasus don't vote, I've personally witnessed uh, in um, five polling stations uh, a lot of people who voted for Putin. It's strange. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is discussion about stereotypes. I particularly took an effort and went to the place where it's the hardest life in the Northern Caucasus, where during last year it was the most social economically wise complicated life. The people have been even uh, receiving compensation because uh, it was a counterterrorism operation in the region going on. And even in this region, a lot of people, well, a lot of means the people I was talking about, the people I was talking to. Dozens of people uh, have been uh, saying publicly, yes, we voted for Putin. Yes, we like this. I like particular very old man who was saying, uh, I got a big pension. I live in all alone. That's enough. 10,000 rubles, it's, it's a good money. It's a little more than $300. He paid 15, 20%, uh, yeah, 20%, maybe 25% uh, uh, for the housing. 
Um, the guy who's saying it's enough money for him and he likes his living is a guy who, who is uh, actually very poor. Um, poor to all standards, uh, except the um, uh, certain uh, discussion about starvation and uh, standards we observe in uh, African countries. Even a very poor guy was for a while looking for beer of Prokhorov, Russian oligarch. Interesting, he was saying. I respect this guy. He got his billions. I respect this guy. But I would vote for Putin. To give you a hope, I promised uh, Katya to share the story which is very well known by the colleagues on the panel about um, a new type of activity which is happening in Russia before the protests. Uh, it was, I think, very inspiring for me. I don't know about my colleagues how inspiring it was for them. Uh, uh, a great step uh, made by the young um, Russian students mostly uh, who uh, have been uh, participating in campaign uh, which was focusing the name of Sakharov, Andrei Sakharov, uh, the name which is very forgotten, very much forgotten uh, among the young people in Russia, but not only. And the young um, students of the different Moscow universities participated in a campaign which was uh, partly fundraising campaign to open a museum uh, in a flat where Andrei Sakharov was working, where he died. And the idea was to collect a small donations, very much as it was in Obama campaign in 2008, a very small money from a big amount of people. And they succeeded. And um, 1.5 million uh, rubles um, uh, was collected. And now the Sakharov Center, the reputable organization, would open museum. It was done by the students, by the people who have never participated in any political activities. It has a lot of challenges. I would not tell you all of those details, uh, but um, that's just one example, that there are highly motivated people. They are ready to uh, participate in, in, in campaign. They do want some specific results to be seen, because it was a short campaign for very specific short time frame and a very specific result just to open a museum, to let it be open, not with our friends from the United States or Germany, the charitable foundation, not with Russian oligarchs, not with Russian state, which is very rich, by the average people, by people who just want to have a museum flat of Sakharov in the city, and we don't have it currently. We have a, uh, a great NGO which has an archive, library, a place for meat, but not a personal place of Sakharov. And that's a very small, clear result which was reached. And I do think that there are a lot of people in Russia, my final words, which want to reach results. They are ready to motivate themselves and their friends and their neighbors. But they want to see what would be the results, what we would reach, what would be not only outcome, but an impact of our work. And discussions on social networks don't really always give an understanding of the impact. What would change? I think there are a lot of experienced uh, new type of activists that do know how they can change things in their own city, in their own village, in their own yard, in Moscow and other cosmopolitan huge cities. There are a lot of those people. What would happen with them in the next six to 12 years? That's a big question. Thank you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shamelessly just sort of speak from a Slava's point of view for one second, which is it's, it's kind of a moan of pain that joins itself to your comment that we keep hearing over and over again um, that there's no interest among Americans in Russia. And this is average American. Uh, uh, average. Uh, well, but no, 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 I'm not criticizing you. I just, I'm in a room full of journalists. This is my chance. I just want to say, please, all of you have an opportunity not to repeat that there's no interest among Americans in Russia today. <laughs> please don't repeat it because our administrators listen to those things, you know, so, uh, and actually, it <laughs> And we believe there is a lot of interest, and we have actually lots of students who are interested in Russian today. So anyway, but thank you very much. 
Um, anyway, our next speaker, Tonya Samsonova, I, all I'll say is if you look at the two um, institutions next to her name, um, they bridge, in a sense, two eras. Echo Maskwi, we've already heard about its role in the Glasnost period. And I remember seeing, being in, in August 1991 in Moscow, and uh, the role especially it, it played, Yura uh, Shikashikin was actually at our hotel room door, you know, having just come from Echo Moskvi on the first morning of the coup. Um, you know, and one of the things was that it kept operating, you know, most of the time during the coup. And also Slon Ru, uh, which I hope you will talk a bit about. So thank you for being here. It's really my pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Harriman Institute and Timothy Fry, who invited me personally, and Ala Rajkov, without her help, I would manage to, to get here, because I will, well, miss everything. Okay. So uh, uh, two days before the flight, I, I, I saw a title of the conference, uh, uh, Cold War, and I was wondering whether it is a historical society conference or something like that. I'm not a historian, so I can talk on, on, on this on this point. And then just before, two days before this flight, uh, I saw a movie, a so-called documentary investigation made by the governmental uh, TV channel NTV. At, I suppose uh, most of you knows uh, know, know, know this uh, this channel. So uh, uh, the documentary was uh, Anatomia Protesta. It was about how uh, how those uh, those protests uh, uh, and by whom they were inspired in Russia. Uh, uh, it's a really very very long movie, but I want you to show just one fragment about American spies who stand behind all these movements in Russia, who inspires Orange Revolution in Russia, and the Barack Obama administration who pays for us from, uh, to, be, to be on the street. So, uh, here we go. Look, here is an American spy who works for the embassy. Let's, let's see. He's, he's standing on the Pushkinska Square uh, uh, just after the elections. Uh, the next day, along, uh, in the evening, it, it's, it, it's, it's Monday, and in the evening a lot of protests coming on, uh, on, this, on the street, and an uh, NTV reporter spotted him on the, on the mob and, and tries to ask him what he's doing here. But it's obvious he's spying. <laughs> What's your name? She's asking him. Uh, I don't speak English, he eventually says. Russian. Don't speak Russian. Ah, he, I don't speak Russian yet. <laughs> and, here's, and here is another one spy from the American embassy. Somehow he pretends to be uh, uh, not, an, not an American one, but a German one. Okay. Do you understand Russian? She asks. Please go, he says. <laughs> Perfect actor. <laughs> Maybe they just were, were working around this and they just wanted to stop and listen to some to somehow. I, I, I just adore this voice on the behind the uh, behind the movie. <laughs> But if they are just strangers, why are so, they are so shy? Why don't they want to talk to us, uh, he wonders. Oh, oh my God, this is important. He says the coordination of the protest process is the key task of the uh, Western creators of the process. So the context is everything 
which ha what happens in Russia is somehow inspired by 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 uh, Barack Obama administration, by by Un United States of America, and so on. My, 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 the best the best thing is. Uh, uh, he, he talks a lot about creators and creatorship and the Institute of Creatorship and so on. And then he shows America. Just. It's obvious, he says, that American uh, administration doesn't want Putin to be a president of Russia. Uh, they never try to, uh, to, to say that it's not true. And here is uh, one, my favorite one analysis, uh, Mr. Polikov, who, who explains this. Uh, and afterwards, they show America and American crisis. This particular country, who has so many problems, tries to do something with our country. You'd better solve your own problem and manage your own business. This is the conclusion. So, uh, after this film, uh, I, I, uh, the, the, the theme of the conference, the Cold War, wasn't, uh, the, didn't seem so bizarre to me. And um, if, <laughs> if. Uh, if we uh, look uh, at, this, at, at this situation from the framework of, uh, of, of the Cold War, of the war of propaganda, uh, we, can, we can see it. Uh, uh, look, there is a very, very simple logical scheme. Uh, big country of Russia has, their, uh, has its enemies. It's, it's the United States of America, it's foreign enemies. It has enemies, domestic enemies. Uh, the, uh, the, these are the guys who protest on the street. And the conclusion, it's very, very simple. Those who protest on the street are inspired by our enemy abroad. So, uh, so we're, we, get, uh, we get paid by, 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 by the uh, Gosdiep, so-called. And um, who State we? Debt. Huh? State but, debt. Yeah. So, um, so this is the context. <laughs> and after, after that movie, I'll, I'll do like this. A huge, a huge protest uh, for, against TV became, uh, happened. It was on uh, on Saturday. Uh, I was in uh, in the United States then, and um, you know uh, these protests happened not because uh, uh, people were petrified how truth were harassed harassed by, by the NTV. It was it wasn't the first time that happened. It's just the, the most vivid vivid uh, example of what happened, but it's not what it wasn't the first time. And if we think about and uh, those people who came to the uh, office of the Antiva on Saturday were mostly journalists. And if they think about this uh, Cold War, we can we can find out that there is a Cold War and war and propaganda between uh, government-oriented, government-owned media, uh, such as main TV channels, and digital, uh, or digital uh, small medias, who, who, who are uh, comparatively more free, more liberal. So people, uh, the war are, uh, is not against United, uh, not between United States and Russia, but between two uh, two medias, governmental one and uh, digital small ones. So here, here are the protests. And uh, you know, uh, they came to protest not because they were petrified again, but because they feel of this as, uh, and they pr their perception of this is the perception of war. And if you have your enemy who's shooting at you with their propaganda, you should answer. And this was the answer. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> It was really, really the context of everything is inspired in, uh, by, by, by the United States. It's so funny because uh, after, after uh, this, uh, this film was broadcasted, there was a day where G George Clooney was arrested and the same day uh, Mr. Udaltsov, who is a, a well-known Russian activist, was released from the jail and uh, I, I liked uh, the joke on my Twitter. Uh, what is the connection between George Clooney being arrested and Sergei Udaltsov being released? We don't know because we don't uh, watch this channel anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so, so, so let's proceed. Uh, but uh, I want, to, uh, I want to, uh, you to, I want to give you a glimpse of this war between journalists of two pools. Uh, I regularly uh, make interview with uh, one of the most popular Russian uh, TV anchor, who is uh, 
pro-Lukashenko, pro-Qaddafi, and pro-anti-Americanist, anti-Semitic, uh, and so on, so on, so on. So, uh, and he really thinks that Russia suffers from America, and so on. And 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 once in a while, I ask him whether whether you have been to America. He paused and then replied, "Yes, even uh, even uh, I've been to Washington D.C." And, and we proceed with the program and I said, oh, I have a clear evidence that you're an American spy. I thought that was a joke, but after the program, after the broadcast stops, he came to me and asked, Tony, don't you really understand how, how it hurts my reputation? And really it hurts, believe me, because his audience really don't need to think that he's an, uh, he ha has ever been to America. Uh, the, oh my God! Okay, enough, uh, enough for, 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 for the anecdotes. Uh, during this conference, during these two days, I, I, I heard uh, I heard many times that uh, the important role of the internet in Russia changes everything, and people who have access to the freedom to the free information, to the free circulation of different views, um, now change uh, change our country, and this is so important, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, well. Uh, uh, that's right, the, the internet matters and the, the, the availability of the, of the unbiased information or, or different sources of information is really very important. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people who have access to, to, to the internet in Russia do, do read in, uh, news in the internet. And uh, look, uh, I, I made it, uh, a, 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 a research during three months. I chose top ten news uh, on Russian agenda, and put, he, uh, put these news, uh, put these items on the questionnaire. And I was asking continuously, uh, or, or I was uh, questioning uh, internet audience, which is 44% uh, of Russian population. Uh, whether they knew, know this news or not, whether they can recognize these titles, these headings. And um, among those uh, ten to top 10 news, there were official news showed on TV and unofficial ones like uh, Evgeny Chirikova has protested in Himkinskilis or something on Khodorkovsky case, which is not broadcasted on TV. So what we found out that uh, average recognition of official news which uh, among internet audience in Russia is about 60% per item. Uh, so every item on average is recognized by 60% of, of the internet audience. But average recognition of unofficial news, which you can only knew by, uh, by the internet or by, be, uh, by, by, by the Ahav Moskvi uh, radio station or by, by some other sources, which has not such a big circulation and penetration as on TV, for example, is for about 25%. So uh, it's persuading you know, those who are already persuaded in, in some facts. It's, it's trying to reach, uh, you, you, you can't, you can't, um, you can really, uh, really rely on uh, on the access on the internet, on the penetration on the internet, because even if 100% of Russians uh, will, will have an access to the internet on the daily basis, that doesn't necessarily mean that all these 100% of Russian population will want to, new, to know these news. They don't want to. So. Uh, so this, the, 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 the availability of the news doesn't necessarily mean that people read this news. Um, just to compare, uh, federal TV channel's audience is 95% of the population and internet penetration in Russia is 44%. So, and among those 44%, only, 24, one, only one quarter of those uh, n n knows uh, something about unofficial news. And uh, the, the, the next thing is uh, um, we, wanted, we wanted to know whether the internet audience of Russia have some uh, other political views uh, than the, the other Russia, uh, whether they're more liberal, may, maybe they, they value more uh, the, the, the personal freedom, the economical freedom, and eventually we found out that none, they don't. <laughs> Look, uh, this is political preferences of those who have uh, um, access to the internet in Russia. Uh, there are two axles. Uh, on, on, the, on these one, on the horizontal one, you have uh, economical freedom and the 
vertical one, you have uh, personal and civil freedoms. And uh, in, in the right, in the green corner, there are those who uh, evaluate the most uh, civil and economical freedoms. And there are 9.6% among internet audience. On the other hand, those uh, on the red corner, 38.6% are those people who, who really, well, well, we call them government-oriented people, but it's a very, very soft name for them because they really want the government to control everything in their life, every personal freedom, every economic, well, really. Um, and these, this is among those who have access to the news and to the truth, so-called. Um, let's see, he's uh, the youngest ones. They are left, as you can see, because they choose socialistic, uh, socialistic ways of life. Um, th uh, just, just a little bit more liberals among among the young people, and these are the, the uh, elder uh, elder uh, generation, 45, 55. How many of them? This is Soviet-oriented people, really, 47.6 percent, and they have access to the information. And uh, that doesn't uh, affect really on their political attitudes. So uh, um, I should talk about 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 digital media and, uh, and my editorial work at Sloan Roo. And uh, when when we when we think about about the war between governmental media and small digital uh, non-government or uh, owned media, we should bear in mind that uh, these small ones. Have, uh, have less resources to cover everything. So it's not very fair war between them. It's like the war from small, small country and the big, big one with a lot of resources. So we are small, but we tell ourselves we're small, but we are smart. So what we <laughs> invented, uh, yeah, because they, they, and we're, we're small, we're smart, and uh, we're very, very business-oriented ones because the more, uh, the more views you have on your uh, articles, the more advertisement you can sell. And we're so closely connected to the uh, sales of advertisement, to the number of views per each article. As I know for each week, my, uh, what, what I, my, my plan, I need to make, just for example, 300,000 clicks on my items. So I need to produce something really interesting. And I have something about three people to do this. And really, uh, this, is, uh, this is quite of the question. So um, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I read some resources, American, who, who tells us how to use digital networking and digital revolution to make reporting more easy. And uh, th my, my, my favorite one is Storyfy. I will show you. Uh, it's, it's a really, a really very good thing, uh, which was invented in Stanford uh, by Knight by Nate Fellows. Look, uh, here is the first item, Navalny release. Uh, what was it? It was in, in December. Uh, Alexei Navalny was, uh, was imprisoned for his protests and then one night he was, he was re uh, released from prison. Nothing happened. Believe me, it's not a new story. He was just released from prison. But okay, 300 people gathered together at 3 o'clock in the night, uh, 3, 3 a.m., uh, and tried to cheer him up and say thank you for him. It's really, it's, uh, it happens in, uh, during, during the night, and we collect uh, 38,000 views per, uh, for this story. These are people who don't sleep in the night from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. because they really think, oh my God, Oh, what's, what's with Alyosha? I hope he's okay. He's he's near to his wife. Near to near to his wife. She 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 was waiting uh, for him to be released. Okay, this is the small Sloan D. And uh, then I, uh, I, I thought I should I should tell this about, about this thing to my colleagues at the Hall of Moscow to the Internet Department of uh, Hall of Moscow. They did the same thing and they collected. 300,000 views, and they're among top stories on American source Storyfy, and then if you enter storyfy.com, you will see uh, reports from my colleagues at the Ahav Moscow, which is really good. 
because because people are, are so interested in this. And really, these protests were very, very good for internet news and for, for business, because eventually we became profitable, eventually a lot of people are interested in these protests, so they really click, 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 and they want to know more, 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 and that's, that's really great. And that, uh, that's a really good push to, to the uh, digital development. That's all. <laughs> I'm going to pass it on to Oleg Kashin. I'm really at because in his biography, um, which is quite short um, in the program, um, the events that many of you in the audience may have um, know, have associate with him, um, which is his the assault that was made on him in 2010, um, we, we have Luke Harding as a foreign journalist who has um, uh, suffered uh, from directly from the state, and now we have a Russian journalist who has, um, in some sense, also suffered from. I I won't I won't stick my neck out and say from whom, but it's about. <laughs> yeah, we'll look forward to hearing your comments. I uh, would like to apologize. I will be speaking Russian. No, I hope I will be. I hope I will be translated. Прежде всего, поскольку выступаю последним, у меня есть счастливая возможность возразить двум предыдущим ораторам. Прежде всего, ну, если уж мы говорим о холодной войне, то, конечно же, она, та холодная война, которую мы знаем и любим, она закончилась в 91 году. Uh, speaking about the Cold War, the Cold War we knew, uh, um, I think it, is, it ended in 1991. Uh, so, um, so uh, Grigory Shvedov uh, spoke about um, anti-American rhetorics uh, in, in Russia, but you shouldn't be confused. This is a different type of rhetorics. It's mostly oriented at the, at the local audience. С помощью этой риторики Путину удобно решать внутренние проблемы, объясняя все противоречия происходящие внутри России происками врагов, которые окружают Россию. So this rhetoric allows Putin to uh, try to solve the uh, domestic problems, you know, putting blame on different forces that interfere into the Russian life and hinder it from the proper development. И эта риторика неплохо действует вот на те 40 процентов государственников, о которых говорила Тоня. So this rhetoric has a special influence on, on the over 40 percent of those who, who believe in, in the, the government. Uh, uh, а в действительности же холодная война, новая холодная война идет в России уже в другом виде совершенном, и это холодная гражданская война, война между гражданами одной страны. Uh, причем иногда это принимает даже вполне комичные формы. Uh, вы видели у предыдущего оратора фрагменты фильма телекомпании НТВ. И наверняка у вас возникло впечатление, что вот есть такой канал НТВ, по которому круглые сутки ведут такую пропаганду о том, что враги России мешают жить России. And uh, uh, I'm sure you have the impression that there is a 24 hours a day channel that broadcasts this uh, type of um, information, which makes people believe that this is a kind, kind of events that happen in Russia on the permanent basis. На самом деле внутри одной телекомпании НТВ есть две редакции. Одна называется праймовая редакция, вторая называется правовая редакция. Uh, so uh, inside NTV there are two divisions. One is the news division, and another is the so-called like legal division. И это достаточно шизофреническая ситуация, потому что одна редакция производит вот такие фильмы, которые вы видели, другая редакция занимается вполне таким несением правды, причем достаточно честным и мужественным, потому что вот та самоцензура, о которой говорил Григорий Шведов, она действительно есть у всех руководителей всех телеканалов. So the, the, the first one, the first division is the one 
responsible for this type of uh, information that it brings to its viewers. And uh, the second division is trying to do their work honestly and to bring the you know, objective information. And uh, naturally, as uh, it was pointed out, that there is always the uh, internal you know, sensor sitting in uh, each uh, journalist and uh, person working, uh, working for the mass media in Russia. И вот эта линия фронта вот этой холодной гражданской войны, она часто проходит буквально внутри одних и тех же редакций, которые, ну, у нас в стране, к сожалению, сейчас все крупные медиа находятся в той или иной форме под контролем государства. Uh, вот этот, этот же канал НТВ, о котором мы уже сегодня здесь говорим, когда-то был вот таким эталонным, лучшим российским телеканалом. Was, uh, Сидящие в этом зале люди из России помнят, конечно же, главного и самого популярного телеведущего этого канала Леонида Парфенова. Uh, Восемь лет назад он вел еженедельное очень популярное политическое шоу. И однажды в этом шоу вышло интервью вдовы, убитого российскими спецслужбами, лидера чеченских сепаратистов Зельмхана Эндарбеева. Uh, eight years ago, he had a, a weekly. He conducted a, a weekly show. It was a political show, and in uh, one of the programs, he interviewed a, a widow of the Chechen um, leader who was uh, killed. Zilmakhan Indarbiyev. Zilmakhan Indarbiyev. Владимир Путин, который отдавал приказ об, об, об убийстве Индорбиева, воспринял это интервью как личное оскорбление и личным решением Владимира Путина Леонид Парфенов был лишен права на профессию. Владимир Путин, который смотрел это шоу и который дал приказ уничтожить Леонида Парфенова TV, TV channel. С 2004 -го года, когда Парфенову было 44 года, то есть это пик творческой формы любого человека, он лишен возможности делать для телевидения сюжеты об актуальной политике. Единственное, что ему позволяют, раз, раз в год снимать документальный фильм об истории, чтобы только чтобы эта история не слишком пересекалась с современностью. Any possibility of working in uh, journalism, and he couldn't cover any current political events and do any programs on, on the subject. He could only was only allowed to um, make documentaries on various historical subjects, prov providing that no, no parallels could be drawn with the present reality. В конце 2010 года, обсуждая очередное традиционное выступление, пятичасовое выступление Владимира Путина по телевидению в стиле Угачавеса, когда Путин пять часов сидит в эфире телеканала и решает все проблемы людей, которые звонят ему в эфир, обсуждая этот эфир с Парфеновым, был такой эпизод. Он меня спросил, ну что же делать, что же делать? Я говорю, ждать. Mm -hmm. So in 2010, uh, I was conducting a show uh, which was the coverage of uh, Putin's uh, five-hour presentation. He did. He was present uh, on the air for five hours discussing various problems in regards to news, uh, mass media and other uh, subjects. And uh, Parfenov was uh, together with me on that show. And uh, he asked me, what's to be done? What's to be done? I said, like, you know, wait, just wait. И тут Парфенов взорвался и сказал, это вы можете позволить себе ждать, вам 30 лет, а мне уже 50, чего мне ждать? So uh, Parfenov exploded and said, well, uh, you have time to wait, you're only 30 years old, I'm already 50, I have no time to wait. Uh, 
Год спустя, когда мы с ним оба вошли в оргкомитет митингов за честные выборы, я вспоминал этот разговор именно потому, что я понимаю мотивацию Парфенова, зачем он, человек, который всю жизнь занимался только журналистикой, вдруг принимает участие в организации этих больших митингов на Болотной площади. And uh, so it, that was when I quite understood his motivation. Uh, he, a person who uh, was very active uh, in, in covering you know, political events in, in Russia, was uh, cut, uh, cut off from that. And uh, so that's why he found it you know, possible and, and uh, necessary to participate in the, the, the work of that organizational committee. At least he could, he could touch upon the elections. Я надеюсь, вы представляете себе эти митинги, которые были в декабре в Москве, но для меня самое интересное, самое показательное то, что в числе их организаторов было, организаторов было всего человек, может быть, 15, и из этих 15 человек 5 было, были журналисты. And I would like to point out that out of the 15 people who participated in that organizational committee, five were journalists. Безусловно, это не нормально. Безусловно, но по крайней мере такова вот наша постсоветская русская традиция. Журналист не имеет права заниматься в реальности политической деятельности, потому что здесь он теряет свое право на объективность, на беспристрастность и так далее. Uh, well, the situation was abnormal, I think, you know, because under the you know, post-Soviet uh, journalistic ethics, uh, journalists are not supposed to, to take part in the, this kind of ventures. Uh, um, that may not allow them to cover the events objectively. They, they need, you know, something, you know, uh, to be in the position when they can look at the events from outside. Но здесь сложилась парадоксальная ситуация. На площадь вышли десятки тысяч совершенно разных людей, а во главе этих людей оказались политики старого поколения неинтересны и не нужны этим людям, и у этих политиков, по большому счету, сложилась иллюзия, что люди пришли к ним, хотя было понятно, что Борис Немцов настолько же неприятен людям на площади, как Владимир Путин. And uh, they mistakenly, like, you know, erroneously, those politicians thought that, you know, this, you know, huge crowds of people, you know, who participated in the protests actually, like, you know, joined them in that and, you know, wanted them to lead them, but which uh, was a, a, an absolutely erroneous, you know, idea. The Nimtsov the, and, you know, the like, you know, they were quite appalling, you know, for those people. And, мне кажется, это тоже очень важно понимать. Я снова обращусь вот к этому графику по поводу того, что в России есть там сколько-то процентов либералов, сколько-то процентов социалистов, политические взгляды для граждан современной России не имеют никакого значения. Ты можешь быть, ты можешь быть социалистом, либералом, националистом, и все равно ты работаешь на государство в конечном итоге. Give them different, you know, statistics. So there is, you know, different uh, statistics about them, like 10% of liberals and a certain amount of socialists, etc. But the political views of the participants don't have any bearing, you know, because you can be anything. You can be a socialist, you can be a liberal, you can be a nationalist. This, it, it doesn't, you know, have any connection to the, what happens there. И мне кажется, более адекватным описанием вот того состава людей, которые выходили на Болотную площадь, более адекватным их описанием было бы то, что это на самом деле аудитория. Аудитория моя, аудитория журнала «Афиша», главный редактор которого Юрий Сапрыкин также был организатором митингов, аудитория уже упомянутого Ленида Парфенова, то есть это были наши читатели и зрители, поэтому нам пришлось э, выходить к ним, чтобы... Чтобы, не было, чтобы они не остались вообще без лидеров. Speaking about the, the people who uh, came to protest on Balotnaya Square in Moscow, it should be said that they, these people were the audience and the readers uh, of um, uh, my program of uh, magazine, magazine Afisha, uh, Afisha. Uh, magazine Afisha uh, um, the editor which is Saprikin, 
and uh, the, the audience uh, of uh, Leonid Parfionov. So there, there were people, you know, readers and audience, uh, our readers and our audience. So we uh, had to be there, you know, to speak to them. И можете записать этот блокнот как вот такой политический прогноз от меня. Я уверен, что после инаугурации в мае месяце Владимир Путин, может быть, первым шагом, может быть, вторым, но обязательно начнет мстить именно журналистам, разгоняя редакции, увольняя главных редакторов и, может быть, каким-то еще образом. Потому что он понимает, что роль журналистов в этих декабрьских протестах и его личная обида вполне глубока. So and uh, I can predict uh, that after um, his inauguration in, in May, Putin will uh, will not hesitate to take revenge. He will uh, revenge um, journalists. Uh, he will probably like good, um, uh, editors in chief of various uh, mass media, various uh, printed media, and uh, etc. So he maybe he will even go beyond that, like let's uh, simply firing them and closing up uh, different publications. В принципе, традиционные медиа, газеты, журналы, телевидение, онлайн издания уже в последние годы находятся под таким мягким, но при, при, при необходимости жестким контролем государства. Mm -hmm. Даже. Okay. And, uh, so traditional media, television, and a printed uh, press, uh, in the internet uh, media, etc., like, you know, has been under the so-called so soft control uh, of uh, the government. Um, даже вот независимая вполне по содержанию эфира независимая радиостанция Эхо Москвы, с которой моя коллега Тоня Самсонова, эта станция принадлежит компании Газпром государственной и вполне под контролем Владимиру Путину. So even the radio station Echo of Moscow, which Tonya Samsonova represents here, is belongs to the very large company Gazprom. And uh, so it's naturally like, you know, controlled by certain... Газета Коммерсант, в которой работают также вполне независимая газета, принадлежит также лояльному Кремлю олигарху Алишеру Усманову, который уже показывал, что при необходимости он вполне жестко может отстаивать интересы Кремля в отношениях с нашей редакцией. Even the, the uh, newspaper Коммерсант uh, belongs to Алишеру Усманов, who is quite loyal uh, to the, the Kremlin, and um, so it's uh, not uh, amazing that it is controlled too. Наверное, такого рода формы собственности являются изначальным основанием для той самоцензуры, о которой говорил Григорий Шведов. So this kind of ownership uh, are not uh, accidental, and that this kind of ownership allows the government to control the mass media and what but I wouldn't make absolute you know, uh, social networks you know, and rely on them or, uh, as the um, um, only sources of information. Несколько недель назад у нас в России появился такой свой маленький Wikileaks. Продолжает, да? Когда некие хакеры анонимные начали публиковать переписку чиновников одного из федеральных агентств. So a few weeks, uh, a few weeks ago uh, there was a site created um, on which hackers uh, made public the correspondence between various government officials. Hmm? Some kind of Wikileaks, uh, Russian analog of Wikileaks. Um, и мы, и мы, и, и мы узнали, что многие очень популярные блогеры коррумпированы этим федеральным агентством, причем вполне формально оппозиционно настроенные блогеры. Государство платит им деньги за то, чтобы они подавали информацию с определенными интонациями. So, and it became uh, obvious that some, you know, a certain number of bloggers were bribed by the government uh, to put information which was uh, Поэтому, когда меня читатели спрашивают, вот особенно после этого скандала, скажи, кому можно верить, я отвечаю так. So when readers ask me, like, well, after all, who, who can we believe? Uh, that's how I answer their question. Гораздо больше, ну, недоверия, но по крайней мере уверенности в том, что ты понимаешь информацию правильно, когда ты смотришь федеральные телеканалы или, или читаешь лояльные Кремлю газеты. 
So you have less. You may have less distrust for the information when you read, you know, f federal channels of information. Let it be newspapers or, or TV channels. Потому что вот ты смотришь вот этот фильм НТВ "Анатомия протеста", где показывают американских шпионов, помогающих митингам, и ты понимаешь, на самом деле правда это вот то же самое, только наоборот. So because when you watch a documentary like uh, Tonya, uh, the, uh, pieces from which, the fragments from which uh, Tonya has uh, demonstrated, uh, which is called the uh, autonomy of protest, uh, you will uh, view it and you see all the Americans, you know, alleged American spies, and then you just reverse it. If you look at it in reverse sight, you know, this is the truth. И здесь мы буквально возвращаемся во времена той классической холодной войны, когда люди воспринимали информацию, читая газеты, как говорили в России, между строк. В те же времена, что характерно важнейшим э, источником и генератором информации, были так называемые кухонные разговоры советских диссидентов. So at that time, the sources of information and the, what generated information were the kitchen conversations among uh, dissidents and people who supported them. И очевидно, социальные сети в их нынешнем виде в нынешней России играют сегодня примерно ту же роль, что кухонные разговоры. So obviously, the social networks play the same uh, role in, in our present life as the kitchen conversations did in the Soviet times. Uh, я думаю, что Владимир Путин не, не будет править 12 лет, как он хочет. Но несколько лет он точно будет у власти. But for a few years he will be in power. В дополнение к тем к 12 годам, которые он уже прожил, уже получается сопоставимый с Брежневским застоем срок. Брежнев правил 18 лет. Поэтому хоть холодной войны, как я сказал в начале, и нет, застой вполне э, запараллеливается и рифмуется с Брежневским застоем. И я думаю, нам всем придется черпать и вдохновение, и ролевые модели в 70-х годах у советских людей, которые жили в тех условиях. So, and, uh, even though uh, the Cold War in its old sense is not there, but the uh, stagnation or something like the stagnation, you know, of the um, Brezhnev time is still here, and uh, we will have to draw our inspiration and, you know, methods of existence and uh, from the people uh, of the 60s and 70s. That's all. That's, mm? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> We've had the view from inside um, and uh, I guess now, um, because as someone remarked, uh, Russia must always see itself um, from, uh, through the eyes of a foreigner. Um, we now have the view from outside. Um, I'll pass the mic to Alessandra Slam. Um, I, I am going to be quite brief because we've raised, you guys have raised so many interesting questions. I mostly have questions for you as well, but um, I just wanted to say hello. And again, I'm a TV critic, so I watch a lot of Russian television and went to Russia recently to write about Russian television and sort of experienced what you've been talking about. Um, but before I even talk about any of that, I mean, I, I think we need to take a step back and remember that... 30 years ago, 40 years ago, th sorry, 30 years, 40 years ago, none of you would, would be here. None of this would be possible. The only time people talked about telephones was because their phones were tapped. And yeah, so the idea that then that was the symbol of oppression and now the phone is a symbol of freedom is, is amazing. And at the same time you say, but there's so much transparency in the world, how can there not be more in Russia despite the speed of which there's been change, why isn't there more change? And I think we're all experiencing that. We're watching it sort of in amazement at what's happened and, and, and surprised at what, what still remains, despite how fast the world has changed around it. Um, what you all have just been talking about is what I've been watching and writing about, what you all possibly are watching on television as well, that this clip was sent to me by my colleague and Ellen Berry, who's in Moscow now. She sent it to me this morning. Um, because it is kind of the perfect example of what happened before the elections, which was 
state television, which is basically all television, uh, wasn't covering protest, wasn't really allowing anything that was going on after the Duma elections to be shown, except that people were on the internet, they were watching it on, and you all were probably watching it as well, uh, and so there was just too much pressure, so a, a TV station like NTV had to start allowing journalists to cover the opposition, the elections, charges of fraud, up to a point. But the boss is still the state, so you'd have a pro you'd still have Putin for half an hour on TV at a conference, posing and doing the things that Soviet leaders have been doing on television forever. And it was a very sort of bipolar broadcast. And this is what, and I sort of thought, well, that'll end after the elections because Putin will be back in power and things will settle down. And what we're seeing, and that you brought with you, thank you, um, is that it's it's not resolved and it's still a war because the more bloggers, more, more attention the bloggers get, the more the state says, well, you know, we can we can create these little opposition. It's it's like negative advertising for the government. You know, you, you portray Navalny and all these other people as 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 uh, corrupt. Um, elitists who are funded by the West, and you know, some are. So, I mean, how many grants? Well, this is a whole other discussion, but, uh, so it's a problem. I just wanted to say very quickly, I think being a Russian journalist today is one of the hardest th jobs you can have in Russia, because as you were saying, you know, it's not just that you, it's very hard to work on state television or at a state-owned newspaper, or even at Comitessant, which is owned by an oligarch, but even the websites. The fact that you're going to depend on advertising means that someone's going to have to advertise, which means that someone's going to need a loan from the bank. And it all goes back to, you know, the Kremlin, I guess, is, is how you'd say it. And it's got to be frustrating. I don't know how that's going to change, but it's, it, it's, I, I think probably a lot of you have watched Dojd, the, the uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Optimistic channel. It's an optimistic <laughs> channel. It's all pink, so you think you think you're watching a cancer walk or whatever. But <laughs> it's uh, that too. You know, it seems very fresh and new and wonderful. But you know, at the end of the day, they're going to depend on the bank loans. So it's like the prisoner. And I want to go back to this gentleman Parfionov, mm -hmm. who I've known long, quite a long time. And it's the arc of journalism because I knew him in, in the Yeltsin years when he was a young producer. Not at NTV, but at uh, the first channel, I think. Mm -hmm. Back was RT, maybe it was, was. He was making. Uh, he was very proud of the fact that he was he was mining this, the nostalgia, the new nostalgia for Soviet times, and was creating. He was doing remakes of all the great '50s kolkhoz musicals. I don't know. If, you, know which one, you know which ones? You remember which? I forgot. Старые песни о главном. Yeah. Mm? And uh, and I sort of said, well, aren't you worried that? that this is going to backfire, you know? He said, oh, no, you know, we'll be fine. You know, we'll just buy American vodka and watch it on a Sony TV. It'll be fine. And, you know, now he's one of the leaders of this protest movement of journalists. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it was your article about this yeah. in uh, 1995. Uh, yes, oh, a thousand years ago. Fantastic. Uh, and I've watched my friends who are journalists and, and the naivete and the and the bravery and the feeling that things were never going to change. And nobody covered Zugano, remember that? <laughs> Why bother? You know, he doesn't do, do us any favors. Mm -hmm. And you'd go be out on the stump with Zugano in 96 saying, where are the Russian journalists? And they were siding with, obviously, what was in their best interests. And now that has kind of led to a situation where they're trapped, like the, you know, the TV show The Prisoner. You can have a pretty nice life as a journalist if you're not, if you're careful. Uh, you can travel and you have expense accounts, but you can only go so far and then something brings you back. And so I'm not going to talk any further about that because I wanted you guys to a ask some questions and then I have some questions for you all. But anyway, it's great to see you all. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to follow your lead and ask the panelists if they want to respond. I just want to throw one little thing in. Um, only in passing has one other uh, new form of media been mentioned, and that's YouTube. Um, and uh, um, uh, we had hoped to get something on the Dumovsky effect. Here, um, <laughs> on, <you know. laughs>
um, it, uh, talked about here, but also um, something that gets to us only by YouTube, but I think you saw on national television was the um, encounter between Irina Prokhorova and Nikita Mikhailov, which is then expanded because it's now on YouTube. So um, if anybody would like to comment on that as you answer one another, I'd be happy to hear that included too. But now, do you want to I respond? Think we let these people have been so patient. Should we get? Oh, well, we have. A, I'm, we have. I think we. I'm watching the clock. I mean, I, I think it, it, if you guys <laughs> have something you would like to say to one another first, if not, I can just. I'll. I'll just open it to the. You know the Monson's case. Uh, the Monson's case uh, uh -huh. on YouTube. Yeah. So you will. You, you will so explain. Our, if, okay. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, uh, before the, 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 the Zuma campaign, uh, Putin visited uh, uh, Olympiski, which is a sports center, and there were a lot of people there. Uh, and there was a boxers fight, and uh, after, after two towers, uh, after the box, uh, th this fight, Putin arrived on the scene, and there clearly was whistling. Uh, and s some guy uh, shooted this with, uh, with, uh, this, with his cell phone. and. Uh, uh, and the huge uh, question right whether the, the, this was whistling against Putin or against Monson who who lose the fight and uh, the official reaction was sure against Monson but the video collected more uh, more than 1 million views and this is more than uh, than uh, governmental um, uh, programs on TV or Vesti or something like this, uh, the evening news. It's uh, th this YouTube collected. So if if they whistled against Monson, why so many views? Uh, and uh, on my flight to to, to uh, New York, I met Monson on the on the plane, and I asked him. <laughs> and I asked him, yeah, I have a photo on my uh, Instagram account, and I asked him who they were whistling against, uh, you or Putin, and he answered me like like an, a diplomat. He said to me, well, you know, Russian people love me so much. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the answer. <laughs> but even, even Mr. Peskov, who is a press official of Mr. Putin, replies to this movie, and he said, sure, it was against Monson, so I don't know whom to believe, Mr. Peskov or Mr. Monson. И добавлю, если можно, после этого было вот традиционное угощаевское выступление Путина, длинное по телевизору. After that, uh, Putin spoke at length uh, on TV. И вот в этом выступлении Путин посвятил 15 минут объяснению того, что ничего не было, он ничего не заметил, а если было, то он не обижается. And uh, uh, it uh, took him 15 minutes uh, to elaborate uh, on the fact, and, uh, that, and he was uh, saying that, well, I don't know, I didn't notice, I uh, like, uh, apologized, so it was 15 minutes. Let's speech. be honest, when you have a five-hour speech, 15 minutes is not too much. <laughs> well, we end up. On YouTube. Oh. <laughs> I would also react on YouTube, I think. We talk about YouTube very often um, uh, in, in a very uh, previous century form as about a video which is downloaded somewhere and you can watch it. The most important thing why we in Caucasian not, for example, publish every day a video on YouTube is because people share it. Because we see the video of Caucasian not somewhere in the Far East, in a, in a website in the Far East, in Siberia, in the places where it's God knows for how many thousand kilometers away from the Caucasus. It's, it's very important how many people watch it, as colleagues said. But it is even more important that it is a challenge to everyone to engage, to take a video and put it in your website, in your blog. It's, uh, it is important because it requests from the audience to react. The comments are under the video. Uh, the likes under the videos, they are important. This idea of engaging is um, crucially important. And that's why I think uh, then traditional Russian TV companies, they also download their videos, some of them also in YouTube. That doesn't work. And then the people do put their video, and then they got enormous amount of views as as a video which was made um, during this um, sport thing uh, is important because people share it. This idea of engaging through sharing is a crucial thing. If more people would use it in a year, in two years, that would make enormous difference. And that's why new 
new TV programs, some of them, uh, or new TV channels, some of them, try to use this engagement, but very often they're missing that your substance should be different. You can't download the stupid propaganda in YouTube and expect everyone would watch and share it with the examples, with exclusions you made, then it's obviously the, uh, the, uh, the propaganda story. So the type of content, I think, might change. Тоже хотел бы добавить одну, одну фразу. Во время выборов парламентских YouTube сыграл невероятно важную роль, потому что все могли наблюдать на видеороликах YouTube вбросы на выборах, нарушения на выборах. Это было очень наглядно и полезно. So YouTube was very important uh, during the electoral campaign uh, because everybody could, could watch and see all the violations, all the inaccuracies, all the fraudulent activities that were done during the election. Ну и не знаю, известна ли вам эта смешная история, когда по окончании выборов генеральная прокуратура провела проверку этих роликов на YouTube. So I don't know whether you are aware of the fact that um, it's a funny story that you know the uh, general prosecutor's office, you know, um, began to verify all the information which was on YouTube. И после этого было заявление Генеральной прокуратуры, что это не настоящие ролики, потому что все они были размещены в Америке на серверах в Калифорнии. Um, now I think we will turn to the microphone and um, uh, Luke, you know the drill, identify yourself, sure. this is being taped. Sure. Um, Luke Harding from The Guardian, just a very quick question for Oleg. I, I, I know this is a painful subject, but could you perhaps tell us why, why you think you were beaten up and who was responsible? Luke, uh, да, к сожалению, мы вчера с вами не увиделись на предыдущей панели. So unfortunately we didn't have an opportunity to uh, talk you know, yesterday. Потому что, вот если честно, если бы я читал, если бы я узнавал Россию только из ваших текстов, мне бы самому было бы в ней жить страшно. So, uh, honestly, if I knew about Russia only from what you write, I would be scared to live there. Но что касается нападения, на меня тут все просто, потому что я уже больше года громко кричу о том, что я считаю ответственным за это нападение про кремлевские молодежные движения. И 5 апреля... Uh, as to the assault and the beating, uh, I've been you know, talking and yelling in every street corner about it, that I th um, think that the pro-Kremlin uh, nationalist, you know, young uh, youth are responsible for what uh, was done. И 5 апреля здесь будет показ фильма «Поцелуй Путина», в котором я отстаиваю эту версию и всех приглашаю на показ этого фильма. Документальная Hi, my name is Max Sen. I'm at the Journalism School here at Columbia. Uh, we touched a bit on Leonid Parfionov, uh, the TV presenter, uh, being uh, central to the opposition, but there is another TV, TV presenter who is probably even more famous in Russia than him, who has undergone some kind of political awakening uh, during the protests, and that is Ksenia Sobchak. And I was wondering <laughs> uh, what you, as um, uh, long-standing you know, so-called liberal journalists, uh, feel about her being a participant in the protest movement. Well, I'm going to start just because my colleague... <laughs> She's in New York now. Yeah. My colleague, <laughs> Ellen Berry, wrote a profile of her, and I wrote about her a little bit when I was in Moscow, and I basically would like to hear what you all think. I find it odd that I sort of thought she was a joke. I kept forgetting these tweets from her on my uh, Twitter account, and I couldn't believe that she was taken seriously as much. Um, <laughs> But the truth is, you know, she, she was the Paris Hilton of, of Moscow, and she's now the sort of Pastianara of the pro protest group, and she's actually kind of good at it. I mean, she's a smart, funny, very sort of uh, good on television kind of person, and there aren't that many people like that. And so my impression was, as much as I would like to make a lot of fun of her and have, uh, that people take her seriously for a reason, but uh, you guys may disagree. Just the same. 
Ну и, наверное, важно пояснить, что, несмотря на ее образ Парис Хилтон, ее отец был одним из лидеров демократов в 80-е годы, и мне кажется, для нее это важно, продолжать его дело. So, uh, even though she can be compared to Paris Hilton, uh, Ксения Собчак's uh, father was uh, one of the Democrats uh, of the 80s, and maybe she wants to carry on, you know, his cause, you know. В ее появлении на Болотной площади наибольшая интрига связана не с тем, что она девушка из шоу-бизнеса, а с тем, что она с детства дружит лично с Владимиром Путиным и говорят, что он ее крестный отец. Just uh, as a personality, and uh, the thing is, when you are so talented as a Ksenia Sabchak, you try to find place where, where it's not so boring, and the the the, the, the oppositional movement is not a boring place, so it engages <laughs> her a lot. Really, it's it's difficult to resist. You have a boring uh, boring uh, um, atmosphere at governmental media, uh, a so-called Paris Hilton. Uh, personality and you have something which is going on and which is interesting and you should definitely be there to gain more popularity to gain more uh, something like this and, and the other thing I actually I, I think I'm among uh, not many of you read the book of Ksenia Sabchak but I did uh, <laughs> And I really believe that uh, she wrote this book by herself because I, read, I, I listened to a lot of her <laughs> radio programs uh, on the Silver Rain radio as I um, just, uh, and that this, uh, can, uh, this, 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 it seems to me that she, she wrote a book her, by herself. And she was not so very liberal. She was not so, she was really moderate. She was really moderate because she has a lot of friends and she's really involved in this establishment so-called. And that's really difficult to, uh, to call your friends in the establishment. And she's, she, uh, she writes he, uh, this on her Twitter. Uh, so you, you, you call your friend from the establishment and he simply can't answer you because he's afraid of himself because you, she has a, a, another reputation now. It's not very, well, uh, and, and, and she converted, she converted from the moderate person, from the person uh, who can com make a compromise with the power to a person who is just Oh, revolutionist, because uh, her program was closed. Maybe you know the Gazdep program. Ah, yeah, uh, speaking about Cold War, her program was named Gazdep uh, administration. Uh, so, so it was closed because of the censorship. And she, well, that's all. I'd like to add a, a historical context to all of this, what's Can happening you please in... Please identify yourself. Oh, I'm right? sorry, Oren Drewinkus, in case anybody cares. But, uh, <laughs> when I was in Yugoslavia under Tito, I could wander around the Turk Republic in Zagreb and hear bitter denunciations of just about everything from the Politburo to the deteriorating, to, to deteriorating quality of Gavrilovich Salami. There, there, there was no obstacle, not in the press, however. Uh, a kind of a Zemichakian subpadenia, I was in Brazil, when Carter was denouncing uh, the regime of the generals and the, the lack of, uh, of civil rights. And now, the press in Brazil seemed to be untrammeled. There were reprints from the New York Times, from Der Spiegel, from Le Monde, but when you watch television, all you got was telenovelas, soap operas. What's the parallel? Well, the literary types, who, which might do something, couldn't, and the not odd, the people, wouldn't. And it, I don't know if anybody reads Machiavelli anymore in, in, in Russia, but the, one of the chapter headings of his, in his advice to the prince is, Segui il tuo corso e lascia dir la gente. 
follow your course and let the people prattle, narod botayet. <laughs> and Tito understood this, and the Brazilian generals understood it. Stalin foolishly didn't, and he wasted a lot of money. But another point, in Russia today, it seems to me that internalized censorship is really the best. It doesn't cost you anything, and you don't even have to hire a spiedermikini to monitor it. But whatever happened to some is that. If it, it, does it exist? And if it doesn't, why not? It's, you make it sound as if there's still a great need for it. Thank you. On, on some as that, if I may, uh, uh, if I may, uh, my comment would be, I think uh, some of that as a Cold War is still, is still uh, here in Russia uh, very popular. And uh, with the some of that uh, now works uh, uh, not one keyword, but as a two words. It's digital some of that. We have digital October from <laughs> Krasnoy Oktyabr. Uh, we have a digital some of that. Uh, so it's very popular. You know, the um, very interesting surveys about the amount of time people spend, uh, spend on social networks globally. And Russia has a leading position in a um, um, uh, few social networks. So people spend a lot of time in uh, digital some of that. Uh, a question which interests me, it's not about is that some is that it's self-publishing it's about distribution what was a key thing of some as that the key thing of some as that was those very brave people who have been doing a very technical thing in a type type uh, writer in the time when xerxes have been not uh, available they've been very bred in distributing in sharing, in reprinting, in making 12 copies, 10 copies. That was a complicated thing. That was a, a, a bravery, special bravery of people who have been doing technical work. Many of them have not been part of the dissident kitchens uh, of uh, uh, Russian cities. So who are those people who distribute today? These are also not always only human rights activists and very brave, like, heroes like uh, Nadira uh, uh, here from Dagestan, Nadira Risaeva. These are also average people. I think it's a crucial issue. That's a tipping point moment. Then average people, a lot of them, starts to participate. Not a great heroes, but average people by sharing stories, important stories. So my, my feeling is we are on the age. We might come to this point then a lot of people would include themselves in distribution. But it's still a question. Would it happen or not? I don't know, personally. So just react to the sum of that part of your question. И тоже хотел бы добавить просто одной фразой, что вот о читателях Макиавелли. В Кремле был главный читатель Макиавелли до декабря этого года Владислав Сурков, помощник президента по политике. So, speaking about uh, uh, people who still read Machiavelli uh, in Russia, I should mention that it was Stanislav Владислав Сурков, Владислав Сурков uh, in uh, Putin's uh, inner circle who did read it. Его убрали, заменили немного более примитивными людьми, которые умеют сгонять рабочих на митинги в поддержку Путина. И я думаю, на этих людей главная надежда русской революции. Чем больше глупости они сделают, тем все I'm Katrina Vandenhuvel, and I'm honored to be interviewing Nadia Ashkikina in the next panel. But I was interested in um, what you said, Alek Kashin, and thank you for your brave work and for what you have sustained in the line of duty. But picking up on what Alessandra said uh, about Parfionov and how he not only made films about Soviet kitsch and nostalgia, but he also made films, for example, about the Dieti Dvatsal uh, Dvatsalka. Mm -hmm. You spoke about the importance that we may have a new period of stagnation in Russia, but we will have to draw our inspiration from the people of the 60s and 70s. And I wondered if you could speak of that. Related to that, though, is the importance of history. And it seemed to me, as you spoke of NTV, all of you, um, this film looks odious. I've seen clips. But you know, in 1996, NTV played a role as a mouthpiece of the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. 
in uh, different ways, but it was not independent in any way as it's been discussed in the US media. And just today there's a story about the possible criminal charges against Babchenko, mm -hmm. who says, and quoted without any countervailing point of view to Kathy Lally, quote, it is 1937, referring to the Stalinist repressions. In 1937, I believe 1 1.9 million people were arrested, 1 million people were killed, and the rest sent to the gulag. I wonder Not where all, all of this Stalinist repression analogies gets one in the context of the fight for the struggle of press freedom in Russia today. Uh. Как раз тоже хочу процитировать, извините, Парфенова, который, описывая 96 год, очень хорошо сказал, что тогда власть и пресса заключили сговор против общества. I would like to quote Parfenov, who wrote in 1996 that it was the time when the, the, the power, the authorities and the press uh, like, uh, had an agreement you know, against the society. Безусловно, Путин настоящий наследник Ельцина, просто у Ельцина было чуть получше с пиаром. So, uh, of, uh, Yeltsin, with, with the, the и во многом, конечно, все, все корни нынешних там, проблем с выборами и так далее, это, безусловно, 96-й год выбора президента, фальшивые, на которых победил Ельцин. Но... Опять же, то, что какие-то люди в 90-е чем-то не тем занимались, не оправдывает того, что в нынешнем 2090 году уже новые люди занимаются гораздо более неприятными вещами. Много лет путинская пропаганда еще без вот этой американской тематики строилась, но на отрицании лихих 90-х. Вот тогда было все плохо, поэтому у нас сейчас по-прежнему все плохо. Bad in our time, and we inherited a terrible inheritance from the the 90s, and this is what uh, we are reaping now. И вот действительно интересно, чем они будут объяснять проблемы России после того, как аудитории надоест американская тематика. Может быть, они будут обвинять марсиан в том, что марсиане вредят Путину. Yeah, and, 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 now, like, you know, when the time will pass and uh, they will exhaust everything in relation to the anti-American propaganda, whom else will they bl blame? The Martians? I, before we get to the next question, I just wanted to, to add a thought to that. One, I do think it is that the hyperbole that is sometimes used, not by any of you, but the, the, this notion that somehow as Katrina was saying, that uh, this is analogous in any way to, the, to 1937 is just, you know, I mean, too much. it's too much. It's, 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 it doesn't do anybody any favors. Um, just for the sake of argument, if you look at it, because when I was in Moscow, I, I was sort of seeing the world through Putin's eyes for a, for a bit, so I was watching so much TV, but the truth is, the West is spying on Russia, and they did find, you know, spy equipment hidden in Iraq, you know, and it was, uh, the British government had been denying it for years, and it actually was there. It is true that the American ambassador is a pro-democracy reformer who, you know, got, who what was Russia in the, in the 90s, um, and was very much friends with the Nimtsovs of the world. Uh, and the American government, does, there is a Cold War of some kind. We don't feel like the Russians are on our side. Syria has been a problem. Um, we envy their oil and, and we don't like Putin's foreign policy or his internal policy. So it, there is a reason, and you know, if you look at it again from Putin's point of view, the opposition is um, disorganized and unreasonable. <laughs> so 
that's something that I just wanted to throw at you as something that uh, that doesn't really that when you talk, just talk about the government being anti-American the reason they can say that stuff on these silly programs is because at some level people believe it and at some tiny little level uh, it's true and on some level they believe this yeah oh of course they believe it absolutely I mean I think Putin really does believe that the foreign not the, the whole stuff the, the West is out to get him you know at some level no it's not just cynical because it but mm -hmm. Uh, uh, to what Alessandra is uh, saying, um, yes, I think um, uh, that's, that might be one of the explanations, but uh, to, to put your point to what Katrina was talking about, uh, I would also disagree with Babshenko, who is great, by the way, uh, that it is uh, 1937 today in Russia. But in terms of in terms of deportations of the nations, in terms of um, mass repressions, no, it's not. In terms of the consciousness of a country which is surrounded by enemies, let's uh, remember what was in a, with the young Soviet Union. This consciousness of the enemies around, this is something which was very much used um, uh, in the Soviet Union, and not after World War II, but before it. So we can say, some ideas, some concepts of propaganda of the Soviet times are used very well today. So when we are talking about 1937 today, in terms of saying Russian authoritarian state is the same as a Soviet totalitarian state, I disagree. When we talk about the same practices, the same concepts which are used today and taken from the past and they're working very well, unfortunately, including the reasons you just made, because somehow the BBC made this film and somehow we have evidence that the rock was real rock, real rock with uh, uh, equipment inside, uh, uh, and so many other facts are also, unfortunately, on the desk. But these are two different things. We are still in this reality. There is still this predominant culture of propaganda and many other keystones of Cold War. Yes, they are, but it's a different animal. It's not the Soviet Union, it's not the 37. But these practices are still used and unfortunately would be used. It would take longer than 20, 25, 30 years to, to really become a different country. It would take a few generations. Uh, I'm not sure if I would see this, uh, that uh, it would be really Russia, but not post-Soviet Union. Um, I was wondering, um, I Sa think, Sasha oh, sorry, Devogel. I'm Sasha DeVogel from <laughs> um, the Harriman Institute. I'm a student there. Um, I think Mr. Kashin had mentioned um, the possibility of a crackdown on journalists um, once Putin comes back into office. And I was wondering if you saw that also happening in the Internet, because they haven't been particularly good at regulating or controlling the Internet in any way, partially, I think, because it's not, um, the penetration is not that high yet in Russia. But um, seeing how the protests over the last few weeks have um, spread online, do you see a crackdown coming on the internet? And if so, how do you think that would um, how do you think that would look, and how would that affect what you do? Прослушал вопрос, извините. Ну и что понятно, что уже регулируется и контролируется интернет, и значит, каким образом есть ли еще какие-то уже так сказать, признаки того, что на интернет сейчас так что стараются его Ну, на самом деле, это вечная страшилка, что, будет, что будут, там, не знаю, как в Китае, блокировать Google, блокировать что-то. На самом деле нет. Это вот как старинный анекдот про адвоката, который. Uh, so well, this is something like you know, some uh, to, to scare like you know the uh, uh, people. Uh, oh well, just you know, you just you wait. It will be a crackdown on the internet, like it is, is in China when they blocked Google, etc. And. Um, uh. Старинный анекдот про адвоката, когда сын адвокат приходит к отцу и говорит, папа, поздравь меня, я выиграл дело, а папа отвечает, ты идиот, это дело кормило нас много лет. So, uh, like it's an old joke about a, a lawyer and his son. You know, the lawyer's son comes to his uh, father and says, well, 
Uh, Father, congratulate me, I have won the case, and you, you know which case. And he says, he's a viewer in India, this is the case that's been, you know, feeding us for many years. Если представить, что завтра в России будет заблокирован весь интернет, без работы и без денег окажутся там десятки людей, которые получают гигантские деньги от правительства на пропаганду в интернете. So if, if they will block or control or regulate internet, and it, uh, then you know dozens of people who are paid by the government to put uh, uh, the information the government you know affairs on the internet, and uh, it pays good money for that. You know they will be out of work. I would just add, um, when we're talking about the, the, the point you made, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the guy with the big scissors who would cut the cable in Atlantic? No, we are not. We're not talking about the same golden shield which was made uh, in China with the Western companies involved very much including American and Canadian ones. I think we're talking about more silent things which are happening already. And I'm glad to say Commerzant made a good article about a new software which, is, which was supposed to be launched in December to, uh, to monitor in a better way what are the comments um, published. We, we do have already available ministries, laws, equipment, software to do these kind of things but in a more gentle way. It's not to completely control things. I would agree with Alec. Uh, yes, there is no point to just close. There is no point to have a scandal um, with uh, Yahoo or Google or any other uh, big global provider. But how it is possible to control without scandals? We have a SORM to special um, legislative piece which is used for many years uh, together with SORM 1. We have new agency Roscomnadzor. We have enough tools if government would like to use. They don't need anything new. Just recently a major news was Russian major company providing domain name Rue Center invented new paragrapher of their contracts with, uh, with any of the um, um, owner of domain. It was already not new. There are so many legislative pieces, rules, orders. If they would want to use just a couple of them, that would be enough to control. The Russian laws, laws are not providing journalists uh, a, just a, a possibility to do their work properly in case they would be used. The, the problem uh, of Russian laws uh, is the same uh, than a good thing about Russian laws. The problem is that many of them, laws of a new time, are very bad. But it is another good thing about those laws. They, they are not used. I don't want to be uh, the, the advisor of Mr. Putin, but still, uh, the, the good way to, to, uh, to make harassment on the internet is um, look, uh, you, often, you, you can often tell to a journalist who works for a governmental media that you, you have a choice. You can work for the digital source. Maybe this is not so, so big one, but you will be paid the same amount of money and you will be truly uh, self-realized in a profession so they can choose whether to work for the NTV or whether to work, for example, for Sloan Rue. So uh, uh, to, to organize an attack for a slow and ruse isn't very difficult. And on the 4th of December, during the day of the parliament elections in Russia, our site was blocked. So I came to my office at 9 AM, uh, switched on the, switched on the computer, and I found out that, uh, that they can publish anything these days. And uh, if the, the situation continues, for example, for for one week, which is not very expensive to organize an attack on slow and ruse for one week, uh, we will be ruined because uh, we can't uh, we can do uh, our job uh, we can't uh, sell advertisement and so on and so we ruined in one day and a lot of journalists uh, will be fired and will came to the, not a lot but still and the argument for for the for those who works on on NTV and the argument you always have choice will be ruined too because uh, if the attack will happen Sloan is very small but if the attack will happen they can clearly answer, okay, if I go uh, uh, and fire from Antiva, I can work anywhere because every media can be just like this closed. 
uh, because of the economical reasons, because of the re business reasons, not because somebody came and said, okay, I, should, uh, I will switch off your side because I'm a censor man and so on. We, it's, it, it will be absolutely si silent. Uh, uh, you, you won't, you won't spot, spot that, uh, this because I, I, I'm not sure you all always monitor these small sites. But the, these sites are a great opportunity for those in, journal, in our profession to, 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 be, to be fair with, with themselves. Since we're all, all almost out of time, this will be the last question. Maria Snigavaya, a PhD student in political science at Columbia. So a very short question to any of the participants who would love to answer, maybe a very simple one. Uh, so do you think, imagine the situation that Russia didn't have internet. Would the uh, political turmoil in December and February happen or not? <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who is Mr. Putin? Um, <laughs> Если бы в России не было интернета, Россия была бы Корейской Народно-Демократической Республикой. Ну почти. Поэтому это совершенно некорректное сравнение. Без интернета много бы чего не было еще. So if uh, Russia uh, didn't have the internet, it would be the North Korean you know, uh, Republic. So this is uh, uh, the comparison which is not quite um, <coughs> correct because uh, there would be um, many things are absent from the Russian uh, life uh, if Russia didn't have it, the internet. Oh, oh, okay, we've got two minutes. <laughs> Three minutes. Valery Kuczynski, I teach at Harriman Institute. Uh, there were many questions, but if I may, I'll tell you a brief joke from the audience. As you know, there was the assassination attempt against Putin, which was prepared in Odessa, Odessa. in Ukraine, and it was foiled by the joint efforts of SBU and, and uh, FSB, FSB. And the joke went that Vladimir Vladimirovich will not participate in the attempt he will send his representative. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that is an excellent place to end this excellent discussion. Um, thank you all so much um, for a wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you.